The same spirit who brings peace to your internal chaos also sends you out as a peacemaker into the city. The spirit of peace is also the spirit of peacemaking. These two work together. And over the course of the first 30 years, the 120-person church formed in Acts 2 floods the Roman Empire with such overwhelming life that the empire falls to its knees, not before power, but before love. How does that happen? I mean, not just in a fairy tale, but in an actual city with actual people and systems and, and social norms and processes and, and power pools. How does that happen in real lives in a real city? The powerfully healed become powerful healers. That's how it happens. How does the Spirit empower mission? Not through our gifts or our strengths, but through our wounds. It would be a mistake of us to glorify the early church. They were nothing special. As they began to gain a bit of momentum, the Roman government did an investigation into this new sect, and the report is recorded in Acts 4. When they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They weren't particularly intelligent, compelling, attractive, or qualified. They were unschooled and ordinary. But they were filled with the same spirit that filled Jesus. And our liberation is in their commonness, not their giftedness. The scandal of the early church wasn't their gifting, it was their commonness. It was that common people, powerfully healed, become powerful healers. How could Peter stand up, lead a revolution in front of authorities that were threatening his death when he cowered at the social exclusion of a teenage girl a couple of weeks ago because the powerfully healed become powerful healers? How about Mary Magdalene? How on earth could a once demonically demon-possessed woman become a pillar of a movement that took birth in a thoroughly patriarchal society because the powerfully healed become powerful healers? And how could uncommon, eloquent prayers from the lips of ordinary people actually heal bodies and make the disabled stand up and even the dead to rise? The powerfully healed became powerful healers. And how could a spirituality that is built on on the public execution of a mostly overlooked peasant become the most stunning sociological move in the history of the world any way you measure it because the powerfully healed became powerful healers. The Holy Spirit is not an escape from the suffering of this world, but a way to come alive in the midst of the chaos. There's this old uh, fable in the Jewish Talmud of a rabbi uh, who goes to the prophet Elijah and asks, Elijah, when is the Messiah going to come? And Elijah says, why don't you just go ask him for himself, for yourself? And the rabbi responds, where is he? He's sitting right there at the gates of the city. Well, how am I going to pick him out from the crowd of all the other people at the gates? And Elijah says this, he is sitting among the poor, covered with wounds. That's who God is. He is the wounded healer, to borrow a phrase from Henry Nouwen. See, the scandal of Jesus wasn't his power, it's his wounds. It's by his stripes we are healed. He held together supernatural power and the loving power of a a God in the most consequential suffering that we face in the midst of this world. He's a wounded healer. He held that together in one body. And the scandal of the early church wasn't their success. It was their wounds, their commonness. And the scandal of the Holy Spirit isn't power. If there is a God, a creator to be made known, we can assume power is a part of the equation. The scandal is the power of God hidden away in wounded people. See, the thing that makes you an excellent candidate to be used by God, it's not your gifting, it's your wounds. The thing that makes us excellent candidates to rewrite the story of our city through love is not our gifting or qualification or ideas, it's our wounds, it is our commonness. Brennan Manning writes, anyone God uses significantly is always deeply wounded. We are each and every one of us insignificant people whom God has called and graced to use in a significant way. On the last day, Jesus will look us over not for medals, diplomas, or honors, but for scars. Are you common and wounded? Wow. (laughs) What a start. God's not looking for people who have it figured out. 
And there aren't any spells or techniques to master. By the Spirit, the powerfully healed become powerful healers. And the most powerful healing that comes from your life will always come from your healed wounds. By his wounds we are healed, and by our wounds we join in the healing of the world. See, the Holy Spirit means that the chronically anxious can become a non-anxious presence in the midst of your high-strung workplace pouring life into the Dead Sea. And it means that the addicted can become a safe harbor for others who are looking to find freedom. And it means the depressed can be filled with incomprehensible joy and then give that away. That the insecure can become courageous, inviting people into the very life that they previously hid. And the quick-tempered can be flooded with self-control so that their transformation is part of the healing for those that they've previously wronged. And it goes on and on like this in every variety imaginable. Soren Kierkegaard says, with the help of the thorn in my foot, I jump higher than any man with two sound feet.